The annals of history have been used to inspire and inform great video games since, well, pretty much always. From games like the Oregon Trail to Dynasty Warriors, Total War to Battlefield, Assassin's Creed to Kingdom Come Deliverance. While some games are more accurate than most, there are games out there that wear their accuracy as a badge of honour. Game design often involves compromise, which can be tricky when it comes to historical accuracy. How much change is too much? How far should a developer go to be historically accurate? And should sacrifices be made if rigidly following history proves itself to be exclusionary? If we are to take historical accuracy to mean the accurate representation of historical fact and the commonly accepted view of events, then games already have a huge challenge in being a representation of history. Free agency and interactivity mean that things will inevitably stray from the real-world timeline. While many elements of Assassin's Creed Origins are pretty bang on, especially when it comes to aspects like architecture and the political strife of the time, you're playing a fictional character whose actions aren't his own, they're yours. Total War puts a lot of effort into creating an authentic campaign, with units and maps accurate to the represented era. But as a commander and a ruler, you shape the world with your conquests and politics. The more you play, the further away from the real-life timeline you go. But that's not a critique, that's just the nature of the medium. But these examples show that games can be flexible, that there is room for change and different interpretations while still being historically accurate. In many ways, developers still have free agency to make additions or subtractions, and players will always be able to put their own spin on things as they play. When I got to try out Total War Saga Thrones of Britannia, I spoke to Jack Lusted, the game director, and asked about the challenges on creating games that are constrained by staying loyal to the history books. He said, Historical accuracy is more what we tend to term as historical authenticity. It's trying to get the feel of the time period across, making sure that the units look like they were historically accurate, the names and places feel accurate, that when you go through the game, you're not going to go, hang on, this is wrong for the era. It's all about trying to get that feeling across. Like if you go for full accuracy, you're going to have things like on the campaign, half your troops die before you get to battle because of disease, or a battle where you can't control anything and you're sort of watching as things play out over several hours. It's where you draw the line on the accuracy scale. 100% accuracy is pretty much impossible for these games. A lot of these periods, if you did it completely accurate as well, it will be completely alien to one sex of people because of the different social and societal expectations. Jack's use of the term historical authenticity is an interesting point. It's here where developers find the flexibility to present an interpretation of history while retaining a sense of accuracy. Assassin's Creed Origins still feels authentic despite the fact that I fought a giant alligator god. Total War still feels authentic despite allowing me to amass an army of dogs and conquer Europe. And, well, I couldn't be looking at historical accuracy in video games right now without talking about the issue that came up when Kingdom Come Deliverance was released. For those of you who might be out of the loop, Kingdom Come Deliverance launched without any people of colour present in the game. This, understandably, led to discussions about the presence of people of colour in the game's time period, its developers' reaction to this criticism of the lack of representation, and how coverage of the title from the media should be approached. For his part, the initial response from Warhorse Studios writer Daniel Vavra was to take to Twitter and state that there were no black people in medieval Bohemia. This, he said, was based on consulting with top historians. He went on to question if people really think Warhorse Studios would be making a historically accurate game from its own country without knowing its own history. The somewhat combative response drew some criticism, and Vavra later made a statement to GameStar.de where he said, I apologise for my lack of care and thoughtlessness in my personal communication, which has led to misunderstandings in the past. Should I hurt feelings or give the impression of propagating a kind of ideology, I apologise for that. Vavra went on to talk about the issues that were in dispute, specifically on the matter of the ethnic composition of the population of Bohemia in the Middle Ages, when and where Kingdom Come takes place. Probably the most serious allegation of the current debate revolves around the accusation that we would actively deny the presence of people of other skin colour or ethnicity in our game and thus promote a racist worldview. That's wrong. I personally do not deny this fact, nor does Kingdom Come Deliverance limit itself to any ethnic group. The nationality of other characters reflects what we know about Bohemia in 1403. As already mentioned, the plot of Kingdom Come Deliverance is limited to a limited area of today's Czech Republic, an area that lies far inland from the European continent. Based on our sources, the region was mainly populated by people whose regional origin is in present-day Czech Republic, Germany, Poland, or Belgium. In addition, the sources speak of a few people of Italian origin who worked mainly as stonemasons and architects in the big cities and a Jewish community. Of course, the situation at the time looked more heterogeneous in some other countries, countries whose coasts have been heavily travelled, for example, through maritime trade. We have already dealt extensively with historians and historical sources while preparing for the work on the game. When the first allegations were made, I reiterated and intensified this discourse to make sure that we do not portray history in any altered form. 
Credit where credit is due, it sounds like the designers of Warhorse did their due diligence, and they even went on to cite their sources and literature they used. However, a number of historians disagree with their findings and design decisions. German magazine M Games asked the Historical Institute of Aachen University and Johannes Gutenberg University Mainz, who said there were at most Turkish people, like the Cumans who appear as the enemies in-game, but otherwise said the presence of non-white people could be questionable. There is, however, some evidence, including art pieces that include people of colour in medieval Bohemia, like Saint Jerome from the Theodoric of Prague from 1360, or John of Apeva from the Saint Matthew Evangelistary from 1368. Of course, I'm not a historian, so I tried to do some research into the debate myself. I got in touch with Professor David de Avre from the University College of London, and he said, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the existence of any people of colour in late medieval Bohemia was impossible, but we would be talking about a statistically minute proportion of the population. Nevertheless, games that follow history to the letter, based on what ancient tomes and history books said, aren't infallible. History, at the end of the day, is both found and written by humans. Humans can make mistakes or miss things out. They can have both conscious and unconscious bias or adhere to long-term cultural constructs that sway arguments or subconsciously lead those who read it. And of course, history is written from the author's own point of view, and they can often exclude many other considerations of the time. Using history to create any form of media involves picking through these ancient biases and cultural concerns, and even rewrites to what may have been taking place over centuries. But developers have already shown that they're willing to be flexible when using history for the basis of the games. Call of Duty World War II, for example, authentically uses the Second World War to present its story and as a setting for its multiplayer, but they made the decision to allow players to play as female American infantry, despite female soldiers never serving on the front lines. Total War presented a unified Russia in a time where they were actually bickering fiefdoms in order to allow for smoother gameplay. Instances such as these, of which there are many, show that it is possible to be authentic to a time period and place, while also taking some liberties to be inclusive, without compromising the realism. Although traditionally thought of as an entertainment medium, games can be a powerful tool to teach. Total War taught me about kingdoms and technologies I never knew about, and sparked an interest in Roman culture when I was young. Games like Medal of Honor, Call of Duty, and IL-2 Stumovic made me interested in learning more about World War II, and I only knew who Joan of Arc and William Wallace were because of Age of Empires 2. And now more recently, Assassin's Creed Origins Discovery Tour has an entire separate mode designed to teach me about ancient Egypt. Assassin's Creed Origins especially is being praised for its attention to detail and Discovery Tour for leveraging this as an educational tool, but even then Discovery Tour still makes small concessions for censorship. Most notably, it covers up nude statues, which otherwise would prevent younger audiences from being able to utilize it. Again, this is another example of making changes without undermining authenticity in a major way. Changes that provide an environment that's more accessible and inclusive to everyone. Here, both girls and boys are shown attending a class given by one of the rhetoricians of the era. The team made the choice to show both genders attending class within the context of the game world. Even though it is historically inaccurate, the team felt it was not necessary to prioritize historical sexism over inclusive gameplay. It's difficult for developers and designers to be able to pass every source of information, especially if they believe themselves to be working off accurate historical documents. But at the same time, we have this idea of authenticity in games over bang on accuracy. But if you're basing your creation on what someone else has written in a history book, further scrutiny is warranted, especially where those ancient hangups are magnified into the modern, mostly more intelligent public eye. Why should we follow it so strictly? or restrict creativity and inclusivity and the enjoyment of a product. So my question to you would be, do you think it's possible to create historically accurate or historically authentic games that are loyal and respect the source material of history while also respecting the full spectrum of people that could be playing them? Do you think games would suffer if writers and developers allowed themselves a little more artistic license or open interpretation when it came to use history as their basis? This isn't a question that's easily answered, and it may be a challenge that faces games and developers for a long time to come. But as I play a lot of historical games, and as I saw the discussion surrounding Kingdom Come Deliverance, and seeing both sides of the conversation surrounding that game, it's a thought that I found interesting and a question I wanted to pose to you guys. I hope it sparks some civil conversation in the comments section below, I'll be in there checking out your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you found this little video interesting, or at least a little thought provoking, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Mm -hmm.